I think just not being afraid to treat yourself a little bit like a child, just being totally aware that you're swimming against the tide sometimes and your brain is not designed to function in the world that has systems that are designed for a different type of brain. I do treat myself like how society would think I treat myself like a child. Like I have a big whiteboard here with huge colourful stickers and big bright magnets. And if anyone came in here and saw that, they would probably think, how ridiculous. That looks so silly. You're a 35-year-old man running this big business. That looks like a five-year-old's colouring board. But, you know, if that wasn't there, my whole life would fall apart. So just to zoom out, the broader point is don't be afraid to treat yourself in a way that society might think is silly or childish. It's not. If it works for you, it's not childish. Welcome to Successful with ADHD. I'm Brooke Schnittman. Let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Successful with ADHD. Today, I have Alex Partridge from ADHD Chatter Podcast. He also has a very big Instagram account with short little clips from his podcast. He is also the founder of Unilad, Lad Bible as well, and diagnosed with ADHD in December, 2022. So pretty recent. His purpose and mission right now is to bring everyone on a journey to raise awareness around ADHD. Warm welcome, Alex. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure. So you got diagnosed a year ago. What led you to getting that ADHD diagnosis? So there were a couple of suspicions, I guess. I've always been very impulsive. In hindsight, I've always been very sensitive to rejection. The catalyst, the main event that led me to seek assessment was a really expensive, what we would now call a boom and bust cycle when you get really into a project and you commit time, money, and then you lose interest in it. You know, the, the old joke, you buy the domain. Mine was a podcast. I wanted to start a podcast called Walk Away Wiser, which was going to be a business podcast. So excited about it. And I ripped my bedroom apart, turned it into a state-of-the-art soundproof studio, spent a fortune on equipment, hired an editor, hired a producer. And when the mailman delivered all the stuff, about a week later, I had no interest in doing this podcast anymore. And I was just sat there in my joggers, staring at all these cardboard boxes, thinking, what the hell has just happened? Thousands of ADHD tax down the drain. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I was in denial, so I didn't sell them. I didn't request the refund straight away. And actually it went past the refund period. I ended up having to sell them all on eBay and I lost about 20% of the value. So yeah, there's that ADHD tax right there. But the guy who I hired to be the editor, he witnessed this whole thing. And he said, so when did you get your ADHD diagnosis? And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, to me, like this is clear ADHD behavior. And that was really the first, the first thing that sent me on the, the rabbit hole down researching ADHD. Mm. Was that the first time in your life that someone thought you and told you that they thought you had ADHD? Yeah, that was the first time. I've always been very impulsive. I've always fearlessly started businesses, but I've always, I never showed any of the stereotypical traits of ADHD, I suppose. Going back to my childhood, I was always very still. I was never physically hyperactive. I was never a naughty child. I would sit in the classroom very quiet. So I never really showed any of the stereotypical traits. I guess there was never any... For a male. Yeah, definitely. Um, It was never mentioned by anyone. I was always very anxious. I always... um, I remember having an anxiety attack when I was very young. I got diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder when I was about 14 and put on anti, you know, it's, it's an echo of so many stories of people that get diagnosed later in life. And my hyperactivity was definitely um, internalized. And it, it led me to be very creative. I was starting businesses from as young as I can remember. But when I wasn't channeling that racing mind into positive things like creating board games or selling apples outside my parents house or trying to rewrite Romeo and Juliet into a different stage show loads of different crazy things you know when I wasn't channeling it through them when I was forced to sit in a classroom and 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 be still then 
then yeah, huge anxiety. And, and that boiled over into anxiety attacks several times when I was a kid. So there were signs. If I had the knowledge that I have now around ADHD, it's like, yes, that's ADHD, that internalized hyperactivity. But no one knew that at the time. So I got diagnosed when I was 35. Hmm. So you're 36 now? Uh, sorry. Or still 35? Yeah, no, sorry. I'm 34, 35 now, diagnosed at 34. Your Benjamin Buttons. Yeah, yeah, ADHD problem recalling facts, my own age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We had to think about that working memory for a second. Wait, let's subtract <laughs> or add a year. What year is it? I love how you said that you were channelizing your undiagnosed ADHD into essentially writing screenplays, selling apples. You always had this creative mind and this entrepreneurial mindset, and you still do today. So getting that ADHD diagnosis, what's changed for you since then? I think I'm very aware of the... The boom and bust cycle, I call it, that overly excitement, over excitement that you can get towards a new project and actually to hang back when that happens. And, you know, I, I can go back into my really early childhood. And again, going back to that stage show writing, that is a clear example. I wanted to write a new version of Romeo and Juliet, ridiculous. But I was so excited about it and I printed off the entire script of the Romeo and Juliet play, which probably cost about 10 pounds in printering and a lot of time. Yeah. And when I picked up this bundle of paper and actually sat down at the desk, I didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and I didn't do it and I just put all the paper in the recycling. And that was when I was really, really young. So looking back at that, and there's been countless examples of projects, businesses that I've started in that moment of excitement. Yeah. Spent time when I was younger, money when I was older, and then my interest has fallen off a cliff and there's that sort of ADHD tax and, and loads of examples of that boom and bust. So now I know that that's a thing. I'm like, okay, when I get an idea, I shelf it. I put it on the ideas shelf. And if it's still bugging me, if I'm still looking over my shoulder at it a couple of weeks later, then I start taking action and I take action slowly. Uh, and all of this is easier said than done because when you when you're in that excitement you feel compelled to take action now you want to buy that domain you want to do the branding oh my gosh to... i have 20 domains mm. yeah i think we, we all do don't we we all have that list of that ideas the list of ideas that we've abandoned mm -hmm. um, but a few of them have stuck you know we all have the ability the capability of of landing on something that ignites this this longevity and the sustainability and that happened with me a couple of times and those are my successes but those are the tip of the iceberg you know the, the under the water the rest of the iceberg is is all of those domains that I, I i abandoned yeah no i hear you it's so interesting because i talk about how when we are seeking dopamine with adhd because you know as adhders we're either really below the baseline of dopamine or above the baseline of dopamine. So when we are underwhelmed or bored, we usually have low dopamine, which then gives you that new and exciting idea. And what typically happens when you have unmanaged ADHD or even managed ADHD sometimes is we get hyper-focused on that idea, not even realizing why we started it. How is it conflicting with the things that we've already promised to? And then we drop it. And that's why so many of us with ADHD feel that shame spiral because we feel like we can never get things done. We spend so much money on podcast equipment. We spend so much money on paper or apples and never use them. So I so appreciate those stories. And I would love to know now that you have ADHD chatter podcast and you've had it for about a year at this point, would I say, or maybe a little uh, less? Uh, about six months. Six months. Okay. It's grown tremendously and you have not given it up. In fact, you're pushing forward. You just opened up a studio. How is this different? How is it not a hyper-focus compared to the things that you started and let go? It's really the first business, and I look at it now as a business, that I've started since my diagnosis. There's various things that I do now to try and ensure that my motivation is is sticky and, and remains and that is i constantly reconnect with my why 
Like, why mm-hmm. am I doing the podcast? And the reason I'm doing the podcast is because I want to educate myself around ADHD because I got, mm-hmm. I was so angry that I got missed and I didn't get picked up until I was 35, uh, mm-hmm. 34. So, so, um, <laughs> 36. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the passion is so there because I, I was so passionate about learning everything I could about ADHD, wanted to know why I slipped through the net and and let's make those conversations public because as, as the more I researched, it was clear that there were many, many people who were in the same boat and were getting diagnosed later. And secondly, I am so much more aware now of, of the type of businesses and the type of projects that suit my brain. So the podcast is very much when you actually break it down, it's lots of little hyper fixations and it's lots of little projects. Like each episode to me is a separate mountain to climb and a separate thing to obsess over. It's a separate guest to deep dive into their lives and find out everything about them. So I'm constantly trying to add to it. Moving into the studio is a is a like a whole new business. That excitement was was reignited. I did the podcast for 25 weeks in my flat. But even if I st- stuck at it in my flat, going back to the first point, each guest is unique. Each episode, each week is like a separate mini project. And that's really, I think, what I attribute the longevity to. And I think in any business, for those who are listening, whatever business you are in, is finding ways to keep it, of keeping it fresh. Because especially for the ADHD mind, as soon as something gets stale, as soon as something gets repetitive, then that's dangerous territory for burnout, for losing interest in something and abandoning it and since i've just sure. become obsessed with adhd and figuring out how my mind works keeping it exciting keeping it new um and i honestly think that's why the podcast has has i've stuck at it why my attention is sustained because each week and you probably have the same with this each guest is new and actually the podcast is a business that has grown to x amount of followers and whatever but it's really the combination of lots of little projects and each project is a new guest and that's so that's a new hyper fixation for my brain to go in on and to maintain that excitement yeah the newness of each episode and each project and if i had to guess your one of your strengths is probably connection with humans and learning and we do so much of that on the podcast, right? Connecting with others, learning from others, growing. And I also want to know with ADHD Chatter, you had mentioned to put something in a shelf, right? Think about it. And if you come back to it, then you know it's something that you probably want to invest more time in. Was ADHD Chatter like that or was it an overnight, I need to jump into this right now? So I was terrified because of what happened on my last podcast idea. I spent thousands and thousands of pounds over overspent when I was in that excitement phase and I lost a lot of money and I was very depressed. So again, going back in time, I remember, I mean, it was not that long ago, I remember sitting in my bedroom looking at all these cardboard boxes. And when something, when you, when you lose interest on your ability which is what happened. You lose confidence in your ability and you lose trust in your ambition. So when I had this idea to do the podcast around ADHD, I was, I took it really, really slowly. I did all the excite, exciting stuff. I bought the domain. I went on Fiverr and I instantly bought, hired someone to do the branding. I did all of that typical ADHD. But when it came to, st- should I spend money? Then no, I'll just do it virtually. So it cost about 50 pounds a week to do so there was still an investment but there had, there had to be and yes yeah, six months later it's it's because of those reasons because of that keeping it fresh and also it's not just because of that it's you know i'm i'm able to delegate the bits that i'm not good at i think mm-hmm. that's really important and that comes from huge self-awareness around actually mm-hmm. understanding what you're good at and what you're bad at mm-hmm. i'm very creative i love doing things that are creative i'm terrible at admin stuff me too you know, and I know that now through experience, through lots of meditation, through sitting on the end of my bed at the end of the day and thinking, okay, what, what happened today that I was rubbish at? What was I good at? And, I, and I've done that often enough to know that, okay, don't try and do those bits because those bits aren't suited to your brain. And if you try and do everything, then the whole project mm-hmm. is going to fall down like a house of cards. Mm-hmm. You know, I try and body double 
as often mm -hmm. as, as sometimes occasionally my partner, if I'm having a really hard time doing something, you know, she'll come in and help mm -hmm. me. The, the YouTube thumbnails is a tangible example of those things. Like we do those together still. And it's a thing that, you know, it's, it's going on a, an editing software and making an image to some people might be simple, but for my brain, it's, it's really, really tr tricky. And, but to have her next to me. It has to, to be actually, perfect, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, to have, to have her next to me, it's that body doubling thing, you know, and there's loads of things that, the, those are scenarios where that's really, really helpful. Another thing I've done since the diagnosis is I've started to put mini deadlines in place for myself, and that's been a huge game changer. Um, I mean, I have to do it because I've set every week the episode goes out on a Tuesday, so there's the deadline. But I'm also, I post on social media every day um, or six days a week, and I tell myself to do that before midday. Little like micro deadlines that I put in place for myself that actually add up and it's actually the social media content that's creation macro. that's really grown the podcast mm -hmm. and also to be super aware when i'm but when i'm approaching burnout i didn't have that awareness or even know that burnout was a thing before my diagnosis so if i felt these subtle little signs and this is going to sound like a really silly example but i'll say it anyway Every day when I do my podcast, I film on my phone. I have to transfer the footage from my phone to my computer, and I have to use a USB it's stick. A lot. To do, yeah, it is, and so I have to get. So a, you have to get the USB stick. You have to walk over. You have to put it into your computer. You have to download it from your phone. Right? There's multiple steps there. Yeah, and when I now this is the this is the the bit that I really pay attention to now. When I remove the USB stick, and this is going to sound silly. You have to, you know, we've all been told you have to remove the USB stick safely. Otherwise the world will end. I do that. I always right click. I click remove USB I like, stick. What's going to happen if you don't remove well, it safely? But for Nothing's me, ever happened to me. <laughs> exactly. Nothing ever happens. But I always do it properly. And I know that if I ever get the urge to grab that USB stick and just rip it out, I know that that is a small little shortcut that I've taken. And for me, that's probably going to be the early signs of burnout. So I'm really, I pay attention to the little things. As soon as I start cutting corners on the little things that don't really matter, I know they don't matter. Like you said, you could rip out the USB stick, the world's not going to end. But for me, it's the little things. And I think everyone, people who are listening, we all have little things that we do that might seem like they're not important. When you start cutting corners on the little things, that might just might be the early signs of your body saying that it's time to slow down and it's time to have a break. Those are your triggers, huh? Yeah, it's just being aware of your little things. And when you start cutting corners on the little things, then the big things are probably suffering as well. And if you don't, and if you ignore that, then there might be a big crash coming. Yeah. So it sounds, Alex, like you have a lot of self-awareness at this point. You're implementing a lot of reflection at the end of the day. You're meditating on your ideas. You are um, putting a parking lot to some of your ideas. You're coming back to it if it's still exciting. You're not acting as much on impulses. What was the change for you, though, when you got diagnosed? How all of a sudden do you feel you've learned these things and, and are starting to believe in these things? I think it's just becoming aware that all of these, I mean, when I got diagnosed, I, I really went headfirst into researching everything about ADHD. And when you realize, I mean, you see the list of traits and you realize that they're things that you're living with. I never knew that I had poor impulse control. I just wasn't aware. I just thought that was me living my life. I didn't know that I had was bad at timekeeping. I mean, I knew that I was constantly late for stuff, but I just didn't, I thought everyone was. Gotcha. So it's, it's having a, an awareness of actually of the areas that you struggle with and you because you can't do you can't put things in place to to make things better if you don't even know that they're a problem like i've always been aware that i can and you know I've, i never knew it was called hyper focus when i was at university i would sit in my room and build facebook pages for hours on end to hundreds of thousands of followers completely ignoring my friends going out drinking I just wasn't interested and I was just they were concerned about my well-being so were my parents they were like Alex are you okay you haven't left your room in two weeks I didn't know that was hyper focus so becoming aware that all of these things the good and the bad becoming aware of them like if without that awareness then you can't lean into them or you can't put things in place to mitigate the the, the negative ones yeah yeah 
So it all starts with awareness. And I love how you used your gift of hyper-focusing to learn about ADHD and take it all in. You also said that you were diagnosed with generalized anxiety when you're 14. Are you still diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder after the ADHD diagnosis or was it unmanaged ADHD the whole time? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not diagnosed with it. I haven't been to the doctors about it. I still get anxious. My last anxiety attack was about six months ago. I hadn't had one for about a year prior to that. It's always when I'm in social situations and I'm not able to, when I'm forced to conform to society's expectations of how I should behave. I've noticed that. That's really apparent. My last anxiety attack was when I was sat at a dinner table at an event and I felt that I couldn't rock back and forth. I couldn't fidget. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't be how I wanted to be. And that anxiety was building up. All that energy just went to my head. And I had mm-hmm. to leave the, I had to abruptly leave the table and walk off this anxiety attack outside. I remember that so clearly. And that's always been the ingredients that have baked an anxiety attack. This, yeah. You yeah. Know, I suppose masking is what we would call it, right? Like not allowing myself to be my self. And where's that energy going to go? You know, right now I'm, I'm, I'm quite active. I move my hands around. I always do. Like if you're in a formal, you know, posh dinner and you feel like you have to sit very still or you have to talk very proper then yeah so masking yeah has always been a prompt the cause for anxiety so to answer your question i've never been to the doctors about anxiety it's it's generally okay but when it does come it's when i'm not allowing myself to be my true self and putting yeah yeah and putting on this mask to appear how other people want me to be in various situations It's so interesting. The last podcast I recorded on Successful with ADHD, I had the ADHD accountant on and she's starting to realize that she has autism as well. And she said that she had a uh, generalized anxiety disorder and a social anxiety disorder, but she believes that she doesn't really have a social anxiety disorder because to your point, when she was around her people, she did not have anxiety. Yeah, that's super interesting. I had a I interviewed a psychiatrist on ADHD Chatter and he said that a lot of people think that they have ADHD sometimes and he has to tell them your traits of ADHD can appear, you can appear restless, you can appear fidgety. If you're only appearing Mm -hmm. fidgety and restless in social situations, when you're on your own in your flat, watching TV, having dinner, you're fine. And you might not actually have ADHD, you might just have social anxiety disorder. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, just on a tangent there, I thought that was super interesting. Yeah, no, anxiety and ADHD, there's so many of the same symptoms. And I think that's why so many, usually it's women, get diagnosed later in life with ADHD because they're originally diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety disorder. And in your case, that's essentially what happens because we as women are typically the inattentive type or the combined ADHD type rather than that outwardly hyperactive, as you mentioned. So that's one of the most important things to distinguish when you're getting the diagnosis. Is it ADHD? Is it anxiety? Is it both? And rule out all of the other factors to make sure that you're treating the right diagnosis and you're taking, if you take medication, that you're taking the right medication. Because if you're taking stimulants, but really all you have is generalized anxiety disorder, then perhaps the stimulants aren't going to work for you and it's going to make you more anxious. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I can't really comment too much. I've I've never, I I don't take ADHD medication. I don't, I'll tell you what I do do. I do drink a lot of coffee and I've got to be very careful because if I drink too much coffee in a short amount of time, then yeah, I can get really, really anxious. Absolutely. Yeah. Stimulants can definitely give more anxiety to people with anxiety. But here I have my second cup of coffee as well. I have my seltzer. I have my water. (laughs) All of my different drinks. (laughs) So Alex, looking at you from a bird's eye view, if someone was looking at your Instagram account and saw that you had over 250,000 followers from six months, right? You know, your podcast has been doing really, really well. They would probably say like, oh, He's got it all together, right? He doesn't struggle with ADHD. 
What can you tell people at this point that really like that one thing either you're struggling with or that you, you implement daily to help you just increase your success? Yeah. I mean, I, it's interesting because I've always been pulled by stress rather than pushed by motivation. It, you know, I, I can't sit down on the sofa and watch a film. I, I've tried it and I'll just get overwhelmed with anxiety. I don't know where that comes from, but it, I feel compelled to, to jump up and come back into my computer um, to carry on working. It, you know, it's not healthy, but that's, that part of me has always been a, a contributing factor to, to, why I'm, to why I grew two big media companies relatively quickly and why I've grown this podcast relatively quickly. The, the, the cost of that, of course, is, is to friendships and relationships. And I'm trying, trying to increase the balance and get better there. Um, you know, there is always a cost to everything. And when you do see tremendous growth or something going well in one area, there's generally something else that's struggling. Everything balances, balances out. I think just being super aware to answer your question and for advice to anyone really working on strategies to grow your self-awareness and to really understand what intrinsically motivates you. Because if you're not doing something, especially with the ADHD brain that intrinsically motivates you, that really pulls you out of bed and, and you it sets your soul on fire, then you will definitely quit when it gets hard. I'm in love with my work. I get huge dopamine from the podcast enough that when it gets hard and there are many hard parts, then it's not quite enough to topple me over the edge to quit and to drop the whole thing. Everyone has to be super aware about what actually they're interested in. Too many, So many people are doing things for the wrong reason, perhaps because they've been taught that that's what someone their age or their sex or their wherever they should are be doing. should be doing or what their parents think they should be doing mm -hmm. what self-awareness exercises you know i mentioned that thing earlier around just sitting mm -hmm. down and really meditating and really big inflective and really thinking what has happened in my life that has given me intrinsic joy and intrinsic resentment or discomfort you know what 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 things do I, am I actually tangibly passionate about? It's so important, especially for the ADHD brain, to really do something that you love. And it sounds quite cliche, because, but if you, if you don't love what you're doing, then it, it will, you will quit when, mm -hmm. when, when things get tough, because things will get tough and you have to love what you're doing to get through those parts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that what you're saying, if I can summarize it, is you really need to embrace the power of the pause so you can take a moment and think about your strengths and your values and your motivation, which is what you did in reflecting about your greatest joys, your greatest passions. You realize what those were and you're using them and you're showing up daily, even on those hard days, because you know why it aligns with everything in your being. And you also have your girlfriend who is body doubling with you. So you not only researched all of this stuff about ADHD, but you have someone to go through it with you. You have someone to hold you accountable. And I think that's extremely important because on those tough days, when we do some mundane stuff where things start adding up, we need someone to just be with us and like take us through that journey together yeah definitely and and you've actually touched on the next point really well accountability is i think the keystone the most important ingredient for being an entrepreneur with adhd accountability i have my girlfriend i have my family i post a lot on linkedin funnily enough for me and i don't know why posting on linkedin gives me my accountability Everyone has their version of accountability. If you're not the type of person who feels comfortable posting online, that's that's absolutely fine. We all have a way to make accountability, you know, friends, family. I think 
we're all inherent people pleasers, or I certainly am. You know, the thought of letting someone down is 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 terrifying to me. And actually that mm-hmm. sometimes is enough to get me over the line when I'm when I'm just feeling a bit sluggish or I'm or I'm, or I'm, or I'm not having a great day. That accountability of wanting to impress that person. Mm-hmm. I think just not being afraid to treat yourself a little bit like a child. I say it all the time. Yes. It's just to really accept that like not being just being totally aware that you're swimming against the tide sometimes and your brain is not mm-hmm. designed to function in the world that has systems that are designed for a different type of brain you know so i i do treat myself like how society would think i treat myself like a child like i have a big whiteboard on the side of my desk here with huge colorful stickers and big bright mm-hmm. magnets um and if anyone came in here and saw that they would probably think how ridiculous that looks so silly you're a 35 year old man running this big business that looks like a five-year-old's coloring board but you know that if that wasn't there my whole life would fall apart and i don't i'm not and i'm not being dramatic when i say that that visual reminder that object permanence that out of sight out of mind exactly if those names those dates those things i have to attend those important meetings those reminders if those weren't constantly in front of me in those bright colors in the way that in the way that my brain understands them so just to zoom out and the broader point is don't be afraid to treat yourself in a way that society might think is silly or childish it's not if it works for you it's not childish I love that. Uh, the object permanence and also writing it down, it gives you that working memory to remember it as well. And when you said treat yourself like a child, I love the whole concept of like treating yourself like a baby. I have a 20 month old right now and she naps, she eats, she'll let me know when she's thirsty. <laughs> she goes to the bathroom and that's her world, right? But like as an adhd we are so hard on ourselves more so than we are on others. And we feel the need to be productive and create and do and do and do and drive ourselves to burnout. And if we could take a step back in that reflection that you mentioned and think about the things that we're not attending to, like the sleep, the eating, the drinking water, the breaks, the mapping out our week, on a huge whiteboard with pink (laughs) (laughs) post-its. All of those things are so important to ground us and to help us focus and be successful. So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. And if someone wants to reach out to you, Alex, where can they find you? Alex Partridge, LinkedIn, or ADHD chatter, no spaces on Instagram. Awesome. Awesome. And you have your podcast, ADHD chatter as well. Yes, yeah, you can message me on the Instagram uh, ADHD Chatter or TikTok ADHD Chatter, or comment on any of the YouTube videos, and I will I'll, I'll reply there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the Successful with ADHD podcast. I know that a lot of people are going to resonate with your journey and your advice. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks so much, Brooke. Really, really fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of Successful with ADHD. I hope it helps you on your journey. And if you need any additional support for you or a loved one with ADHD, feel free to reach out to us at coachingwithbrook.com and all social media platforms at Coaching with Brooke. And remember, it's Brooke with an E. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.